Let me pray to open us. Lord God, we do want to follow only your will. Uh, we believe as Presbyterian type Christians that you speak uh, through your word as illumined by your Holy Spirit. And as Presbyterian type Christians, we believe that uh, you guide churches primarily through elders. Elders that meet together, not power concentrated with any one person, but men and women, gifted, spiritually mature, duly elected, and, and who prayerfully try to discern your will for a particular Presbyterian congregation. We trust that you have spoken to our session. We trust that you are now speaking through our session to this congregation. Um, and we pray that uh, we would check that out against your word and uh, that we would pray that our hearts would be open uh, to be in sync with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if uh, we're going down the wrong track, we pray that you would uh, derail the train before we go there. Otherwise, we believe this is your best for First Presbyterian Church. Bless our study this morning. Thank you for the, fall, those, the small groups that took place. And uh, pray that we all are encouraged as we drill down uh, ever deeper into Habakkuk and his message for not only the world back then, but the world today. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. I want to start this morning by reading four verses from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 12. See if this sounds familiar. Jeremiah is complaining to God. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the lion, will the lion mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away. Because they said, he will not see our latter end. So here you've got another prophet complaining to God. It's this whole theodicy thing. If God is all-powerful and all-good and loving, why is there evil? And it gets even more existential here for both Habakkuk and Jeremiah. Not only are you allowing evil in the world, but you're actually using people that are more evil than we are, the Israelites, to punish us. It ought to be the other way around, Lord. What is going on? Um, Jeremiah feels the same way we've seen Habakkuk feeling. And uh, if we're honest with ourselves, that's pretty much our complaint as, as well. Um, well, I remember, I still think about it almost every time, I, I mostly go home now up Broadway. For 10 years, I always went home going up McCullough, getting on 281, and then getting off at Hildebrand. And, but I'd always go up and I'd go under the bridge right there and I'd see our homeless friends in various stages of inebriation, usually. This was after the death of my daughter. And uh, I couldn't drive under that bridge without an inarticulate, if not an articulate, complaint. Why is my little innocent daughter dead and I mean I'd seen people doing all kinds of stuff from the bridge area. Why are they alive? Um, God never answered me. Um, I know they're made imago dei. They are God's creation as well. But that, that thing was going in me, or that theodicy thing. Why are you allowing them? And many of them I knew from my because I interviewed a camp every Monday morning and some of them I knew and they were just some of them, some of them were lovely wonderful Christians some were not nice not nice to me why do they get to live and my daughter doesn't so we all face these kind of complaints against God at various stages of our lives and various events in our lives 
Um, well, I want to say something very uh, important, I guess, about verse 4 of our text. Um, if you look at Habakkuk 2, verse 4, this verse is one you should really uh, know about and understand what it's all about. Some, some people have said that this verse is the foundation for uh, Western civilization as we know it. The just or the righteous shall live by faith. Anybody remember who else picked up on that? Romans. The Apostle Paul in Romans, Romans 1.17, he quotes Habakkuk. Anybody know who picked up on that after Paul a number of years later, like about 1,500 years later? Martin Luther. Luther was an Augustinian monk. Um, the Western Church is Augustinian. Roman Catholics, Protestant churches, we're, we're Augustinian. We're in the trail of Augustine. Uh, after Paul, I would say, and Calvin would say, and Luther would say, Augustine was the greatest theologian. Um, ever since the Apostle Paul. And I think it's probably a, a good analysis. And uh, Martin Luther uh, was obsessed with erroneous theology that was a part of the standard medieval church theology. Basically, that you've got to measure up uh, to be saved. And he was so obsessed with his sin uh, his confessor in the abbey got so tired of Martin Luther coming into the confessional. And I'm just quoting the abbot, okay? He said, every time he breaks wind, he said. <laughs> um, Luther was afraid of going to hell. He could hardly celebrate the Mass. Because when it came time, they'd ring the bell and the prayer of consecration and Medieval, medieval theology and Roman Catholic theology still. At that moment, the, the accidents, the appearance and taste and smell and texture of the elements doesn't change, but their essence does actually change into the body and blood of Christ. And Luther, aware of his own sinfulness, he took St. Peter to the extreme, you know, uh, Get away from me, Lord, you know, when Peter realizes who Jesus is. Well, that's the way Luther felt. So they were always worried, would he be able to finish the Mass? Because it came to that point, he wanted to run out of there. Well, Luther was a, a scholar, biblical scholar, New Testament scholar. And he felt the German people ought to be able to read the New Testament in their own vernacular. So he laboriously worked on translating the New Testament from Greek into German. And when he got to Romans 1.17, he gets to Habakkuk 2.4 when Paul quotes it. And it's like the lights go on. It's a total paradigm shift. Luther's world is turned upside down and inside out when he realizes that the righteous, which means simply being in right relationship with God, the righteous shall live by faith, not by works. It's You're not set right with God by running around doing good deeds, it's by faith. And it's like the Red Sea parts, the sky is open, and Luther's theology comes together, and the gospel of grace kicks in to Luther. That's why Luther didn't want the book of James. And the, he wanted it kicked out of the canon uh, when the reformers were saying, oh, we've got the Bible here. Anything that needs to be added or subtracted, and, they all were in agreement that nothing needs to be added or subtracted. So Luther was, get rid of James, get rid of James. He was, he was so hyper about uh, salvation by grace alone that he wanted any mention of works to disappear. Of course, we know that Peter and Paul are not in opposition to each other. Uh, faith without works is dead. Genuine faith, what, and that begs the question, what is faith? I told this to small group leaders when I was a student at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond. Uh, the last class I took was taught by Dr. Elizabeth Ochtemeyer, Betty Ochtemeyer, 
and uh, it was called English Bible. And she said, I designed this class because we've spent four years having you all chop up the Bible in pieces all over the place, you know, exegeting certain texts. And, and she said, I've seen so many summer, seminary graduates from this seminary and other seminaries go out then with the Bible kind of dismembered and they lacked, they lack confidence and assurance that the Bible is the word of God in the pulpit. And she said, I'm seeing that just take churches down. So she said, I designed this course to pull all the pieces back together for you. And uh, so I want to send you out here on fire for Christ to preach with confidence and assurance. And I will thank Betty till my dying day for that bit. Of, but that all leads to uh, a point when we were looking at some text and the word faith was in there. And she said, you know, what is faith? What is faith? You've been in seminary now for four years. What is faith? And, and we would raise our hands and try to come up with some really highfalutin, convoluted theological statement that we thought would impress her. And she let us do that, especially the guys from Davidson College. Would, you know, this. And uh, being a jock from Trinity University, I was just going, <laughs> and she let it that all come out, and then she said, if you leave this seminary without understanding this, you've lost it all. And we're like, uh-oh, we better take, take notes. She said, faith is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Throw those other things out the window. If you don't get this, you'll never be a good pastor. And I've never forgotten that. So when Luther discovers right, the righteous, those in right relationship with God, get there by faith, by a relationship, a loving. God is not a person like you and me, but he's personality, and he's created us in his image, and part of that means we are able to have personal relationships with each other and with our creator. At a very intimate level, the sermon I'm preaching Sunday, Romans 8 and 12 through 17, Paul says, you know, we become the children of God by God adopting us. He picks us. You know, we're not born into the kingdom of God. We're born again into the kingdom of God by God choosing, adopting us, so that we cry, Abba, Father. That was scandalous to you. Abba is an Aramaic root, uh, word. The best English translation we can come up with it would be Daddy. That was scandalous to first century Jews. You don't address the almighty creator of the universe, daddy. So here's the radicalness of the gospel of grace, that this personal relationship called faith takes us not only in the arms of God, but up into the lap of God, where we can look figuratively, look God in the face and, and address him as, as daddy. I mean, that, that is pretty wild. And, and there's something even more wild in that text, but I'm not going to Steal my own thunder, you'll have to come Sunday. <laughs> so uh, this right relationship is by faith. Um, and uh, so this changes everything for Luther, and the Reformation occurs, and Western civilization comes into being. We go, come out of the medieval times, and um, the rest is history. So we, we owe all that to God speaking through Habakkuk here. Um, Okay, let's, let's go back to the beginning of the chapter now. And um, I said last week that Habakkuk deals with three questions that all of us ask. First one is, does God care? And we've seen that, yes, he does care. Um, here's a lot. And then, is God fair? Because why would he use evil, the evil Babylonians, the Chaldeans, um, that doesn't seem very fair. And we talked last week about hallelujah, thank God that he's not fair, but he's a God of grace. Fair means we get we, what we deserve. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. And the third question, is God there? And that's the question that chapter 2 really deals with. I'm going to go back to verse 1, even though you looked at it last week. Where Habakkuk, if you look at verse 1, he says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what 
God will say to me, and what I will answer concerning, and what I will answer, what I will answer concerning my complaint. So Habakkuk knows God's that He cares. He knows He's fair, but is God really going to show up? Is He going to be there to really do anything? So He's waiting here. He's waiting. It's in His watchtower. Uh, he's at His at His post. One thing I learned from Earl Palmer, who's been one of my mentors, he's the former senior pastor of University Press in Seattle. Earl's just a wonderful guy. We've had him here at First Press. And he would always talk about long-term ministry. So the mistake of pastors is they, they get a barrel of about four years worth of sermons and they move every four years and they have to write a new sermon. And he would always talk about the, the, the wonderfulness and the grace and the fruit of long-term ministry. And he poured that into me. And so, and he, he'd always say, Ron, stay at your, always stay at your post. Never judge how your ministry's going by how your ministry's going. Uh, never go, oh, this seems like a disaster. I better get out of here. He says, never do that. God, if that was true, I mean, or, or maybe this is a, a tough church or a mean church and they're beating this heck out of you, that doesn't mean leave. Somebody needs to be there. Maybe you're the guy God has chosen to be there. So um, I am so glad I met Earl while I was a pastor here. And he poured all this into me. And so I just he said, stayed your post until God releases you. And that's all I've ever done. And I've been in situations where I've cried out for God, get me out of here. It wasn't here. Um, <laughs> and I got his word clearly every time. Ron, just stay at your post until I release you. And so that's all I've done. And that's what I'm back at his post. How many of you here have ever read Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for the Dove? It's a, it's a classic modernist, nihilistic <laughs> play. Uh, it's kind of the poster child for really uh, the modern cultural orthodoxy of, of questioning, doubting, and uh, disbelieving God. Godot's take off on God. And in the play, the stage is bare. It's kind of like this. There's one little tree kind of a scrawny little tree. And there's two characters, Vladimir and Estragon. And they're waiting for some man named Godot to show up. They've asked him to show, and the language in the play is very religious in its overtime. So Beckett's not disguising what this is all about. And so they've asked him to come, and um, it, it's they get word that he's considering their request. Uh, and the play, the dialogue of the play is, is repetitive. It's just repetitive, repetitive, monotonous. And it, and it gives the audience a tremendous sense of meaninglessness and helplessness. Um, and the play ends with a messenger finally showing up to tell uh, Vladimir and Estragon that Godot is not coming. And that's Beckett's way of saying, you know, you can wait on this imaginary little man upstairs to come and do something, but he's not going to show up because there is no such thing. Uh, Nietzsche went a little more straightforward when he said God is dead. You know, this concept of a biblical God, we're now enlightened. We've outgrown that. There is no God there. Francis Schaeffer, a Presbyterian, countered uh, Nietzsche in the 20th century by writing a great book, and if you've never read it, you ought to. You ought to go to the Christian bookstore and get it. It's kind of a classic. The God Who Is There. And Schaeffer was a great an analyst of culture, particularly 20th century culture. So Habakkuk in verse 1 of chapter 2 is doing his own waiting for Godot as he stays at his post. And um, so he's, he's, he's there. <coughs> Verse 2, which you've been studying today, the, the Lord shows up. He comes. 
He doesn't send a messenger saying, I'm not coming. He shows up and answers Habakkuk's complaint and gives him a, a message. And anybody remember when the Living Bible came out? Uh, it was back in the 70s, I guess. And uh, I remember, scandalous is not the right word, but the kind of the thing, and when I read, read reviews of it, everybody went to Habakkuk 2-2. Two, because two. Uh, in the Living Bible, it says, God tells Habakkuk, put it up on a billboard. And if you're in your small groups, you're wondering, well, what's it with these clay tablets? And you know, what's, how does anybody see if they're running around? He's running around. So the, the paraphrasers of the Living Bible said, put it up on a billboard. That's what God's telling you. Back to but that's really what he is telling you. Publicize my message to the, the people. And so God gives him, him this vision of what God is going to do. Which made me think, a uh, question I ask myself, and I ask you, have you ever considered that you are God's Habakkuk? You are God's walking billboard. He's given each of us a message. Uh, another way of putting it is somebody, put it this way, they said, you know, you're the fifth gospel. You and I are the fifth gospel. You and I are the gospel that maybe nobody else is going to ever read. Or they're not going to read the other four. So you may be the only gospel anybody reads. If, if they read your life, are they going to come to Christ? Uh, I don't know. God can use any of us, but do our lives point to God's vision uh, revealed in Scripture? So anyway, in verse 3, the vision is God uh, saying to Habakkuk that he's going to use Babylon to destroy Israel. Um, but there's delay on this. There's delay. What about when God delays things in our lives? The toughest thing about life, I think, is when our experience collides with the Bible, with the God we meet in the Bible. And it does all the time. I mean, we read about, I hear your prayers, I love you. And then we go through something and God doesn't perform like we think he should. In the, according to the way he's revealed himself in scripture. So we're always having collisions between our experience and God's word. And this is one of the reasons why individuals, local churches, and denominations get off the theological rails. I remember John Leaf, my mentor at Union Seminary, always saying the mistake Christians make is they allow experience to inform their theology over scripture. Um, liberal theology, that's what it does. It reads the Bible and goes, well, I don't see any of this happen in our lives today. So they, your experience trumps scripture. Whenever that happens, you study church history, the church goes, you know, whenever the Bible is rediscovered, and taken seriously as God's revealed word, the church urges again and flourishes. And we're going through in the West one of those downturns. And it'll come around in some day. It's not going to happen here at First Press. But uh, John Calvin said this. He said, this is the true sacrifice of praise. When we restrain ourselves and remain uh, firm in the persuasion that God cannot deceive nor lie, though he may seem for a while to trifle with us. The important one there is seem. God is never trifling. It just seems like it. He's not taking us seriously enough. If he knew what was going on in my life, the depth, the agony I'm in, then he would show up and do something right now. It seems sometimes like God is trifling with us. <coughs> Calvin says, that's the true sacrifice of praise that we move forward believing God even when the night is dark and God seems okay. absent. In verse 4 um, God begins to describe uh, uh, this, uh, this soul that's puffed up. It's not upright within. Over and against 
what we've already talked about, the righteous living by, by faith. Um, and this is the way it always is uh, about God and his people. Faith, you know, I've said faith is a personal relationship with God, but that, that relationship involves trust and intimate knowledge of that person. You know, when you, when you have a relationship with somebody, a deep relationship, you trust them. And even when they seem to maybe be acting not like their usual self or doing something that, that you didn't, but you don't just cast them aside because you trust, I know that person, they must be doing something I don't understand right now. And that's the way it is with God. There's a story about a soldier in World War I and he was hit in no man's land uh, between the trenches and he lay there bleeding and um, his best friend that he grew up with, they were in the same inf infantry division. And um, this guy was laying out there for hours, bleeding to death. And then all of a sudden he felt somebody's hand on him. It was his friend who had crawled on his belly across no man's land, very slowly, trying to look like a dead soldier, <clears throat> inching his way, to get to his friend. And when the friend that was wounded saw who he was, you know what he said to him? I knew you would come. I knew you would come. Because he had that relationship. If he knows I'm out here, he'll come. Nobody else would, but I know my friend would. That's the way the relationship, that's the kind of relationship we need to have with God. Faith is taking God at his word, no matter what the surrounding experience tells us. In verse 5, um, this kind of doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the vision. The, the gears shift and it talks about wine being a traitor, an arrogant man who never at rest, greed, why a shale like that. God's really talking about the, the Babylonians here, um, knowing that how much people at First Press love wine. I don't want to say too much, so I'm tempted to just skip this, this verse. Uh, you need to know the Hebrew here is, I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any means. I didn't figure this out. I'm reading what somebody else said. Uh, although I've worked with the Hebrew here, all Hebrew is hard and difficult for me. But the experts say verse 5 is hard for the experts. And this can be taken a number of different ways, and commentators go back and forth of what it really means. Um, but I will say this, uh, it, and this verse is not found um, in the, uh, well, it's there, but they substitute in the Masoretic text that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it doesn't say wine. The Hebrew word is not wine, but wealth. Yeah. Some of you may be relaxing and saying, oh, this has nothing to do with what I drink. Uh, but everyone in this room, myself included, we're wealthy beyond, I mean, compared to the rest of the world, I don't care, the poorest people in the U.S. would still be in the top 2% of the world's wealthy people. And um, I thought I'd end this morning just by going from preaching to meddling, because that's my job. And as a pastor, I find those two things, and I could list a bunch of others, but just, I mean, just zero on these two. I probably have more people in my office self-destructing because of wine and wealth. Um, I'd throw in pornography, but that's not in the text. And uh, I... I can't tell you, I, I'm not a teetotaler, and I don't think the scriptures are preach teetotaling, but I do see people's lives being destroyed, and I, I just worry about that and, and uh, pray for some of my friends. And I always like to say, but the church, the God's redemption, and that is the church can learn so much from AA. The church, we've gotten into, you know, I want to go down to Fourth and Allen Road and look good. So everybody would be impressed with who I am. That's not the way you go to an AA meeting. 
you know, you're on the bottom, there's no presumptuousness, no pretense, very authentic, you know, the, you stand up there and say, I'm, I'm Ron, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drunk. I, you know, nobody goes, whoa, get out of here, what are you doing here? Uh, I think I've told you the story one time, I was doing duty in Griffith Chapel before we had new member classes and the guy comes back to join the church. And I propound the questions to him, do you uh, affirm that you're a sinner on the side of God, justly deserving his displeasure, blah, blah. He says, no. <laughs> no, the answer is yeah. And he told him, well, I thought if I said yes, you wouldn't let me in your church. I mean, that kind of stuff, that mythology is out there. There's none of that in AA. AA was started by a drunk Presbyterian elder, Bill W. He just took the gospel, the gospel of the 12 step methods, the gospel and put it into effect. So we can learn a lot. Um, Jerry Todd, those of you who remember Jerry, he was an alcoholic. In my early days here, he and I became friends. He was also an Air Force, ex-Air Force Colonel, no offense, Ron. And so there were days when he was barking orders. <laughs> and one time I said, Jerry, sometimes you're just, you just come on too strong. And we've become friends, I could say. And he, and he said to me, well, you know, part of it's because I'm an Air Force Colonel, and he said, part of it's because I'm just a dadgum drunk. And I said, whoa. And we, I said, tell me about that. He said, well, I'm an alcoholic. And I was naive. I really didn't know anything about it. And I said, Jerry, when was the last time you ever had a drink? I'll never forget this. He said, 40 years ago. I said, well, Jerry, you're not an alcoholic. You're not. got to fight and God's given me the strength but I'm always just right here and then uh, wealth I remember um, we had a, a, a missionary who's come off the mission field and he was a professor at Gordon Conwell Seminary come here to do a week of spiritual renewal with us back in the 80s his name is David Wells he's still a professor at Gordon Conwell and he talked about his mission experience and talked about spiritual warfare and uh, uh, powers and principalities of darkness that he had seen operative in, in the third world. And there was someone, my recollection was a, uh, she must have been president of the women of the church because she was in the staff meeting the next day with us. I think that's the only reason she'd be there. And David Wells was in the staff meeting with us, and this woman took him to task. She said, I don't believe in evil spirits, and I'm kind of embarrassed that you're in a pulpit saying that stuff last night. And I'm sitting there going, this is going to be a nice staff meeting. And she kind of went at him. And I thought, what is he going to do? And he just looked at her very graciously. Oh, she said, if that's true, then why don't we see that here? David Wells, very gracious, just said, Satan doesn't need to do that here. He already has you trapped in your influence. And I remember thinking, yeah, because I know who she was, and she was very wealthy. I thought, no, no, it's me too. Um, this is not, the Bible does not say money is evil. It says the love of money is evil. I'm convinced God gives Christians great wealth because they can do things, they can run with horses I can't run with. One quick story to show that, how that works, and then I'm going to dismiss us. Uh, one of my elders at Central Credit Baltimore was Dr. Dave Hungerford. He's an orthopedic surgeon at Johns Hopkins. He is the world's foremost orthopedic surgeon ever. Challenge me on that, I'll say, got a hip replacement, knee replacement, Dave invented them. He, he owns the, the rights of every hip and knee operation done in the world. He gets the royalties. And I sat on the board of what was called the Patella Fund, Central Presbyterian Church, where Dave's royalties, which were anywhere between a million and a half and two million dollars a year, he gave 100% to that fund to provide for capital uh, needs for mission stations around the world by land rovers and 
x-ray equipment and stuff. And obviously Dave's a committed Christian. He came to Christ late in life from being an atheist. Um, he, he, and his wife uh, uh, was German. And she had the gift, she could sneeze and people would come to Christ. She had the gift of evangelism. <laughs> they lived in a gated community in Baltimore where only the, I mean, none of us could probably get in there. Every Thursday night, they chose people in that neighborhood to come to dinner at their house. Well, people wanted to go to Gay Mongerford's house for dinner. And then his wife <laughs> would lead them to Christ. Um, well, I couldn't get in that community. You couldn't either. But here's a guy God gave all this money to. He would take it, the Saudi royal family, if they needed any orthopedic stuff, they would fly Dave over there. And he said, I always took all my interns or residents with me. And the Saudi said, oh, sure. He says, I think they thought I needed them in the surgery. I didn't, but they would come and assist me. He said, we get off the plane. Of course, there's no talk of insurance. Blue Cross, Blue Shield. The royal family would meet us on the tarmac and hand me and each of our residents an envelope. It usually had a quarter million to a half a million bucks in it. And so all my residents graduated out of the program free of debt. <laughs> and then they would share the gospel with the royal family. He said, you know, I'm here doing this because I'm a Christian. And uh, his little brochure, if you want to get an operation, said, I'm a Christian. I'll be praying for you before, during, and after your surgery. And Dave gave it away. He, he was a tither and sacrificial giver, and he was making a difference around the world. So, But I've seen so many Christians not do that. And just, you know. Nelson, John D. Rockefeller, when somebody asked him, how much is enough? Always just a little more. Always just a little more. Let's pray. Lord God, you've given us everything in Jesus Christ. In fact, we're going to see that in that Romans 8 text on Sunday, more than we ever can imagine. And we're thankful for that. May we be walking billboards like Habakkuk, um, being so transparent about who Christ is in our lives, not wearing it on our sleeve, but just living out that robust, deep, intimate, personal relationship with you that people cannot mistake us for anything other than your children. Uh, may that be true of all of us uh, for the glory of your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name.